Some build their hopes on the ever drifting sand, shifting sand. Some do a lot of things, but not the child of God who's faithful to the calling as that's set out in the New Testament of our Lord. Our hope is on the rock as it represents Christ who will never, never fail us. It's always there. John wrote in 1 John 5 and verse 13, that's toward the end of that first epistle in the New Testament, the first of three that John wrote. And he tells the people, and so all of us, why he wrote it. These things have I written unto you. Well, what you? That believe on the name of the Son of God. Let us remember that to do anything in the name of anyone is to do it by that person's authority. And that carries us back then to whatsoever you do in word or in deed. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Colossians 3.17 So John says, I have, written, I have written unto you that believe that believe on the name of the Son of God, that believe on the authority of Christ, that believe that He is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man cometh unto the Father but by Him, John 14 and verse 5, who believe what He said when He declared that all power or authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28 18, who believe that He told the truth when He said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. That certainly sounds like one in authority. So John, the apostle of the Christ, inspired of the Holy Spirit, writing part of what is the last will and testament of Christ, says, These things have I written unto you, what you, those who believe on the name of the Son of God. And there's a reason he wrote these things to such people, that ye may know. Now, when you get down to knowing something, that's solid bedrock. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. That's the way it is. So he says, there's something you need to know. And I've written under this category of people who need to know it. And what category of people are they? Those who believed on the name of the authority of the Son of God. Of course it has to do with salvation. Peter said to those who had been brought to believe in Christ by understanding the gospel in that first recorded gospel sermon in Acts 2 when the church started on that first Pentecost following the resurrection and ascension of the Lord. He said to those who had been brought to believe for faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17, and who cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? He said, repent. As believers, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Here it is, in the name of Jesus Christ. It's by His authority. You see, that you already believed in God. His problem was, as Peter had said, ye have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain the very Messiah you, that the Old Testament talked about and you looked forward to, you've done it in ignorance. That is, you've killed Him. You put him to death. Well, these were honest. They received with meekness the engrafted word. They recognized their sins. They properly evaluated their life. And they wanted to be saved. So these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God for a reason. That ye may know that ye have eternal life. It's amazing that the members of the Lord's church who will not say, I know I have eternal life. It's something, something's terribly wrong when the Bible says, and this is part of the Savior, He saves the church, thus He saves every member of the church. When the Savior, through the Holy Spirit, says through John, I've written this to you that you may know that you have eternal life. Of course, it's not right now. We must die physically as the writer of Hebrews says, it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. But we have it in prospect. 
We have it in promise. We will never see the second death once we die the first or perchance the Lord comes back before we die. We don't have to suffer death. We'll never know the eternal second death of the lake of fire and brimstone that this same John would write about in the book of Revelation. We'll never know that. So he's saying, I'm writing this unto you that you may know that ye possess something. You possess eternal life. And notice, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Well, I thought he said they already believed on the name of the Son of God. He was writing to those people that believed on the authority of the Christ to save them. Yes, but it shows that even those who already believe need words of exhortation and enlightenment to be encouraged to focus where they ought to focus. Because everything around us, folks, is saying focus on the here and now. All sorts of decisions people make day in and day out have to do with what's going on in this life that will cease when this life is over. Great concerns given to the affairs of this life. Church members sometimes are not much different than the rest of the world in that their hopes and aspirations are built on the sinking, shifting sand. When their hope ought to be, as we just sang, ought to be on the Christ, on the rock of our salvation. So John says, what I've written unto you is so that you'll know something. You'll know you have eternal life. We ought to focus on that more. I, I can't say that to you who are outside of Christ, but I can say it with the idea of why you ought to be in Christ and faithful to Him as a Christian. I can't say that to anyone here this morning who is a child of God, but he's become unfaithful, or else you've let a sinner to get into your life, but you haven't repented of it. This is written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. And that's always used if you look in James chapter 2, that believe on the name of the Son of God are those who are faithful day by day in service to God. That's who this is written to. Those that love the truth and are abiding in it and are teaching it and are defending it and are always trying to correct their lives according to it. So focus on this word hope. Notice that the idea of confidence comes up. Confidence. John had something to say about that. And you know where he said it? In the very next verse. Verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. The idea of assurance, confidence, and assurance. These are good words. Those are solid words. Those are encouraging words. Notice, and hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. 1 John 3, 19. Now that's not said to one who's outside of Christ. It's not said to one in Christ who just sort of halfway goes about it, and thus you could not say that person is really faithful at all. But notice that this confidence and this a great assurance is produced by the truth that John writes, verse John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So confidence and assurance that comes through our proper knowledge of the Scriptures is really a birthright to all those who are faithful in Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 16 said, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently lest any man fall of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. All my preaching career, I've been in churches where certain members sold their birthright for about anything. They sold their 
assurance of heaven. They sold their confidence. And they despised their hope because this world was too important to them. But radiating from confidence then and assurance is what we sang about, about our hope. Our hope has to do with a, a favorable, confident, solid expectation of glory in heaven with him in the after a while. It has to do with a future that is yet unseen. Paul wrote in Romans 8, verses 24 and 25, For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what doth he yet hope for? But if we hope that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Let me say toward the end of this verse that the word patience is not as we normally use the word today. Patience means you know what's right, you know you're living it, and no matter what comes upon you that is hurtful or whatever, you bear up under it and you keep on keeping on. You never give up. And you try your best to teach that to others regarding the power of the gospel in their lives. But it's all dependent upon their confidence. It's all dependent upon the assurance they get from what the Lord's told them in His Word. It's all dependent then upon their hope. How is it that hope can save us? Because within it is that assurance and that confidence. Christians don't just wonder about saying, Well, you know, I felt pretty saved yesterday, but today I feel pretty lost. That governs most people. People determine their acceptability to God or the lack of it or the rejection on the basis of how they feel. Rather than make any difference whether you're male or female, rich or poor, old or young, educated or not, that has nothing to do with your salvation when it comes to your feelings. Now, our feeling, do feelings have a place in our lives? Of course, God made us with our feelings, our emotions, and thus they have a place. But they never were, our feelings, our emotions never were uh, given to us to determine what's right and wrong. Do you remember Jacob? You remember when his brothers sold Joseph into slavery down in Egypt, eventually down in Egypt? Do you remember what they told their daddy? They said, you know, here's his coat. They tore it all up and made it look like some animal had ripped it up, dipped it in the blood of a goat and took it to their daddy and said, well, he's been eaten up and this is all's left. Do you remember the impact of that upon Jacob? Why, he was full of sorrow and it bore down upon him for years. But Joseph was alive. But as far as Jacob was concerned, because he believed that lies, if it were the truth, he was in misery. And he showed in his subjective feelings, as anybody would who lost somebody like that, the sorrow that such would elicit. But it wasn't true. But his feelings sure didn't testify to that. What determines whether we're saved or not is our proper knowledge of the truth and our understanding of that part of the truth that obligates us to do certain things that we know honestly we've complied and discharged the obligations. Now we're to be happy. The Ethiopian eunuch knew he had obeyed the gospel. Wasn't any doubt in his mind. He knew he had done it. Now what does he do? He goes on his way rejoicing. We've got it right backwards. We are tossed to and fro all day long by feelings because we don't know how to put them in our proper order. I think I probably exhibit my emotions about as much as anybody. I'm sorry for the person just just cold as an old piece of iron this morning at about 5 o'clock outside. Something's wrong when you don't use your emotions like God meant just as much when you don't use your conscience as God intended or your intellectual powers. Just dull as a stump. I don't understand that. But I also don't understand the idea that people don't think a thing through based upon adequate evidence, incredible witnesses, and take what they have and reason honestly and correctly with it and draw the proper conclusion. And then when you know you're right, be as happy 
There's a bird singing this morning when the sunshine came up. Have you ever seen a, I think how silly this is, but it makes a point. Have you ever seen a, a bird out early in the morning crying? <laughs> I've never seen any kind of animal cry like that. I've seen dogs sometimes look like they kind of were embarrassed at what they did. But even then, they don't get embarrassed and ashamed of things like human beings do, certainly not for the same reason. They've just been conditioned to realize that they can do some things and get in trouble for it. But animals just act as God wrote on their DNA for them to act. And he never did tell them. Well, it's cloudy today, and I was looking for a sunshiny day to build my nest. I think I'll sit on the limb and squall all day long. Isn't that ridiculous? It's absurd. But we humans do, because we're different. We have the willpower God gave us, and we have emotions. We have the power to examine, to gather knowledge, to think about it, to put it all together, to reason correctly with it, to draw a conclusion and act upon the conclusion or not act upon it, as the case may be. And John says, what I've written, the information in these words, in this letter, what, what about it? Well, I've written to people who believe that Christ is the Son of God. And, and there's a reason I've written this information for you to take in intellectually and think about so that you can know you have eternal life. And yet my brother says, I just don't think I can know that. John said you could. And who's right? Well, if you don't know it, then there's something wrong in your life you need to correct. If you don't believe the Bible, you don't have the confidence in the testimony of the Scriptures, or you don't have the assurance that those Scriptures give us. Or you have some sort of warped view of the whole scheme of redemption and how God saves us. So radiating from all this confidence that the Word of God gives us an assurance that heaven's our home when we die is this expectation of heaven and an earnest desire to receive heaven. Brethren, do you ever just sit down and contemplate heaven? Well, we ought to. That's where we're going to be when this life is but a flicker of our memory. This life is just a, a blink of the eye. Heaven's forever. And you know, we usually like to, even in this life, on things that we think are more durable, uh, lasting. We think about that. Look how much you work hard to think about the house you buy or you build. Now why? Well, the economy says, you know, that's the biggest and most long-lasting investment you've got. Well, here it is, back to money again. And we work hard and we plan and we figure and we work ourselves up. And then when we get through building a house, I never will go through that again. <laughs> but if somebody offered you enough money, so you can make a big profit, you'd set it to blink the nine, go right back through it again. And every time as you get older, you move into another house, you're a shorter time there. Because <laughs> you're about to leave this house just shortly. How much longer do you have in this house? The body, I mean. So, for we are saved by hope. Well, it seems like to me, if hope's expectation of the future that drives us out of the information John's given us, that gives us confidence and assurance, and an earnest desire to possess the inheritance, Seems to me we ought to contemplate that a little bit every day and think about where we're going. Because we may work awful hard here for a few things and think we're going to be in a while. Boop, it's gone. Some build their hopes on the ever drifting sand. Some on their land, some on whatever. And that's where most people are. I mean, it can't last. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. It's, it's the happy anticipation of good, as the Bible defines eternal good. And you know, that's the most frequent significance in the Scriptures of the word hope. Paul wrote to that young preacher, Titus, in chapter 1, and verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. 1 Peter 1.21 
faith and hope. Confidence and trust and assurance is in God. Now, it's interesting that in order to be in God, you have to be, or in Christ, either way you want to say it, because Scripture says it both ways. You notice to the believer that's repented of his or her sins and confessed that faith, that trust, that belief in Christ as Savior, that person then must be baptized to complete becoming a Christian into Christ, Galatians 3, 27. And thus it's in Christ that we have this hope. It's in Christ that we have a right to anticipate heaven. It's in Christ that we have our confidence, that we have our assurance, that we have our hope that helps save us. seems to me something that helps save you eternally ought to be worth thinking about. But instead what we do, we think about now or tomorrow, which how many people know they'll be here tomorrow? No, you have to think of now. Oh, we worry about yesterday and it's gone forever. And usually it's all about the flesh and the material and the here. When's the last time you dreamed about heaven? Your long home. And that which will never fade away. It's the ground on which hope is based. That is, this assurance, this confidence. Listen to what's said in Acts 16, 19. And it's explaining what Paul and Silas did when they cast out a demon. And it tells about those who managed and controlled this young lady who had it, where their hope was. And it gives us an understanding about the meaning of the word hope. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas, drew them into the marketplace of the rulers, Acts 16, 19. In other words, she could predict these things through a demon, and that's how they were getting gain. Well, that pretty well describes how most people are, but it shouldn't be describing faithful members of the church, those who really are Christians of Christ, because their gain was here. They didn't look beyond so Paul would write to the church in Colossae in Colossians 1.27, Christ in you the hope of glory. It's the object upon which hope is fixed. Paul said to another young preacher, Timothy, in the first letter he wrote to him in chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Now, if you're going to go look into the Greek, you'll find that's the way it's treated. That is the word hope. John says, Now I've written all this to you who believe in the authority of Christ to save your souls. Thus, if they're Christians, they've obeyed the gospel. They've been baptized into Christ. Their sins or alien sins are remitted. The Lord's added them to the church. And now he says, I'm writing this to you so that you will have the proper perspective and know where your confidence should be and know where your assurance is. See, I don't know what all you may have of this physical world or what you may have before life's over. But too many people, too many of those who by word of mouth, they give a lot of lip service to what the Bible says, but their hope's in the here and now. Now let me show you how that works. What's going to happen if Obama's defeated? What's going to happen if Obama wins? And right now, immediately, it comes up in your mind, <laughs> and you go to this and you go to that. You don't have any faith, brethren. Shame on you. You need it right here. Have you ever thought about the world John lived in? When did he go vote? Where was his hope? Where was he when he wrote the Revelation? Exiled on an island, away from everybody else. Talk about lonely. And why was he there? Because of his intense, prolonged, dedicated faith in God. It is amazing to me how we can read about such as 
the three Hebrew children who went off into Babylonian captivity lost everything they had, including their masculinity. And yet they're held up as what we ought to be. And we're basking in glory and majesty and material things, the most pitiful one of us when it comes to economic things. But boy, how did we're disturbed what's going to happen when the economy falls flat. Well, I'm, I tell you, I'm going to do what I can as a Christian to be prepared on things like that. But you know, it hasn't caused me to lose one second of sleep because I know who controls everything. There is a God who rules in the kingdoms of men. And if he can't overrule human powers for the good of his family, why should I have any confidence or assurance in him? Well, John says, in the midst of all manner of persecution, that he has written these things so that we would have assurance, that we would have confidence. And yet we in the church, in dealing with matters of this present world that are fleeting by, as if this is the way it is and God can't help me, I've got to help myself. Well, I grant you, the Bible teaches throughout it that God is not going to do for you what you can do for yourself. But have you ever, or maybe you should put it this way, have you forgotten all of, of history regarding what the church has gone through? And what God's people in the Old Testament suffer for the cause of Christ? Read Hebrews 11 and ask, why did God put that in this book? And over and over, by faith, this, by faith, by faith, by faith. And look at the misery they went through. And here we are enjoying the fullness of the salvation of God in the redemption. And our hope, where is it? So we may conclude that if one cannot know his salvation, it's then impossible to have confidence. It's impossible to have assurance. And thus we cannot have hope, that expectation of heaven that we earnestly desire to possess. And guess what? When we don't have those things, we're no better than the alien sinner who doesn't know anything about Christ. Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus in chapter 2, verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Now what did they have going for them as government and an economy in the first century? Who did they vote for? For emperor. What were they going to do to cry out for their rights? Even Paul, though he enjoyed benefits that a lot of folks didn't because he had the privilege of Roman citizenship, had no power at all in the government of Rome. Nobody else did either unless they were in the hierarchy, and especially the emperor was it. Sometimes we've got ourselves at the point where we think we can't be faithful children of God unless we're in a representative form of democracy. I don't know where we learned those things. We didn't get it out of the Bible. You didn't even get it out of history, for that matter. It is a very sad thing when people can be so self-willed and so contentious and so material and so basically hard-hearted that they will deny the simple and plain teaching of what we read in 1 John 5, verse 13. They just don't believe it. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Assuredly, this lack of belief is caught up in some sort of materialist pride and willful ignorance, almost like it's gone to seed. God never intended faithful children of God to think or act this way. But as if denying these spiritual blessings were not enough, some almost even publicly, or they do publicly teach contrary to it. That is, to 1 John 5 and verse 13. Lamentably, they must be marked for the false teachers they are. I don't think we recognize when people teach things that anchor you to the here and now and to the material and keep your mind off of expectation of heaven and where you ought to be thinking about it because hope saves us just as much as baptism saves us. You ever notice that? The blood of Christ saves us, faith saves us, repentance saves us, confession of faith in Christ saves us, baptism saves us, hope saves us, 
explicit language, Romans 8, 24. Well, if it saves us, we better get involved in it a whole lot more than what we have been. Because it's part of the salvation process. So anybody that teaches me one way or the other that I must be anchored to here and now and give over concern to these things, somebody better go back and reread their Bible. And if you can determine the truth about the worship of God on the first day of the week in the assembly of the saints and what those acts of worship are, then you can also determine that hope saves you and what hope is and how it's built up. And when you're anchoring yourself too much of your own powers to save yourself from this present evil world, but usually even that's on a material level. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 through 16, it seems like we heard just not long ago, and if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Hmm. The word of God, for he who wrote the love chapter, saying Christians should treat somebody so they'd be ashamed. Yet count him not as the enemy. So making him ashamed is not counting him as the enemy, is it? Yet count him not as the enemy, but admonish him. Admonish him says, Bud, you know you're wrong. Here's why you're wrong. You know you're wrong. You need to repent. If it doesn't mean that, I don't know anything about the Bible. And then he says, After all of this, now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. We better understand why some are always troubled, why some are always perplexed and distraught. They've set their lives on a route that doesn't encourage obedience to all of the truth, maybe some of it. In those areas where they're not, well, they reserved it for themselves. They're going to do it their way. Then they're mixed up, messed up. We must yield ourselves in every area to all things that God has taught. That's where we begin to have trust. I would say Peter trusted Christ. And maybe thought he trusted him in all things. Until he asked the Lord, when he saw him walking on the water, if it be thou, Lord, bid me to come to thee. And he did. But his faith failed and he began to sink. And he had to cry out, Lord, save me. Some of us are so full of ourselves we can't even say I did wrong and I repent which is the only way nowadays you're going to be able to cry out to the right one Lord save me we better understand why some are always troubled as I said and perplexed and maybe this tells us the answer to some of our mental and emotional problems is because we're too much trying to work things out ourselves and we think we are to do it in this present world the way that those outside the church do it Really, people like this are, are sure of nothing, and, and they don't trust the promises of God. Such is nothing less than refusing to take Christ at his word. That's the most simple definition of faith, is taking him at his word. And now, lo and behold, what have we done? We've determined that a great many brethren are guilty of unbelief. Assuredly, the eternal life of 1 John 5, 13 is what we all want, but are we willing to follow it and obtain it according to the Lord's will? I know that it is yet to be. I know that it is conditional. Revelation 2.10 says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. But we have more evidence what will be than we do of that which has been. In that, what John said is just what John said. It's not hard language. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. That's the reason. To prove the Bible to be the Word of God, it becomes proof for all sorts of things, in fact, for everything spiritual. We know that our alien sins are forgiven by the same evidence that gives us knowledge pertaining to our eternal inheritance. Know one just the way you know the other. You know God's with you today or he's not with you on the same basis that you know what the plan of salvation is or how you worship God or anything about the church and its work and worship and so on. We know Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We know He said to believers, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for unto the remission of sins. We know Peter said that baptism doth also now save us, 1 Peter 3.21. 
We know that John said to Christians in the earlier part of the letter we started with, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. And then if you go down through this, you'll see that John's whole letter is dealing with what he brought out in chapter 5, verse 13, because he's telling them why he wrote everything preceding that verse. And notice what he says in chapter 2 and verses 3 through 5. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. I just don't believe people who tell me they're such fine Christians and they don't do what he says. If I were to believe that, I'd believe a liar. <laughs> I'm not to believe a liar. I know what happened when he believed a liar. That's what he's saying. Whoso keeps his word in him, truly, verily, it's a fact, is the love of God perfected. So if you want the love of God perfected in you, what must you do? You keep his word. And he says, aha, hereby know we that we are in him. But to be in him is to have the place of assurance and confidence. If you look in verse 29, if we know that he's righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. That doesn't seem to be too hard to me. If you go down to chapter 3, verses 19 through 21, and hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God's greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Through verse 22. If you go over to chapter 5, beginning in verse 11, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And then here's our text. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Wonderful words of life. Wonderful words of confidence. Wonderful words of assurance and thus wonderful words of hope. The expectation every faithful child of God has of the eternal reward of glory in heaven that produces an earnest desire to receive the promise. So, the evidence for knowing either one of these great things, assurance and confidence, comes from the one divine standard. The Bible, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and 2 Peter 1, 3 through 11. Both of them talking about all things that pertain to life and godliness are found in the Word of God. We would alleviate ourselves of so many things that are burdensome to us. And as we grow in that direction, we would look back and say, How could I ever have been so messed up on that? If we will just trust in the exceeding great and precious promises that are given to us and know that such passages as 1 John 5, 13 were meant to strengthen us and to cause us to contemplate glory for us in the by and by. So we end where we started. These things, John says, have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. 1 John 5, 13. Brethren, these words, while they rebuke us for not being more mindful of heavenly things and dwelling so much on the affairs of this life and thus showing our lack of confidence in God to preserve His children, they are still for the faithful child of God wholesome, good, exceeding great and precious promises to bolster us up and to cause us to think of what's just beyond this veil of tears for the faithful child of God. And it's a marvelous thing to contemplate the glories and majesty of heaven 
that awaits the faithful just one heartbeat away. That's how far we are from eternity, no matter who you are. Now are you prepared to meet your maker? What kind of faith do you really have in him since faith comes by the word of God, Romans 10, 17? Have you truly repented of your sins? Con confessed your faith, your belief, your trust, your confidence, your assurance in Christ as your Savior? And have you been baptized for the remission of your sins, thus baptized into Christ, where he's located every spiritual blessing, and one of them is the hope that we've discussed this morning, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. As a child of God, what, what is your life? Are you faithful in all that the Bible says about faithfulness? Do you have the expectation of eternal life in you now? Are you yearning for it? Won't it be wonderful there? Do we sing those songs of hope and courage when we think about heaven and really mean them? Or are they just songs we've sung all our life and we forget really what they're based on? If you're not a Christian, we've studied already several times the plan of salvation, God's plan for a person to become a Christian, that they might have eternal life. As a child of God, are you ready for eternity? Don't you want to go to heaven? Doesn't it make you have a, a good thought to shuttle off this mortal coil and enter into glory by and by, to be away from all the hurt? Yes, even be away from all the unfaithful brethren who try to pull you down rather than lift you up by their own unfaithfulness. Wouldn't it be wonderful to walk, as it were, hand in hand with Jesus, who certainly is faithful to us in all of his promises. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, then we invite you to come while we stand and sing.